All right. Last week, we began a study of the Holy Spirit. And in this lesson, we are laying the foundation for future lessons by first of all exploring the nature of the Holy Spirit. We are looking at the fact that He is the third person of the Godhead. And last week, we began our study. We, we first affirmed that He is deity. And we, we, we looked at the... The, the biblical scriptures that attested to the fact that he is de- deity. Then we looked at his disposition, the fact that he does have personality, just as the Father and the Son do. And we looked at this from the standpoint of his characteristics, uh, his works, and then at the tail end of class, very briefly and very hurriedly, admittedly, we looked at how the Spirit can be treated. Uh, in various sins against the Spirit, and we're going to come back to that in another lesson later on, affirm, that it, affirm His personality. And so tonight, as we conclude this first lesson, as we conclude this study of the fact that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, tonight we're going to look at the description or attributes of the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to look at some designations given to the Holy Spirit, and I, and I think tonight our lesson should really build our faith in God, build our faith not just in the Father and the Son, but in the Spirit Himself as well, in the entire Godhead, knowing that there is but one God, but with three divine essences making up, that three divine personalities making up the one essence that is God. And so with these thoughts in mind tonight, let's begin by looking at the description that the Bible gives to the Holy Spirit. And we're going to find that whatever is declared of the Father or the Son, or you know, or if you want to refer to Christ as the Word, that's fine as well, is also ascribed to the Spirit. When you study the Scriptures, you will find that they plainly teach that the Spirit has all the attributes of deity. Let's turn to begin with to Hebrews chapter 9. In verse number 14, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 14. And if someone would, let's read this verse. And notice how the Spirit is described here. In the context, it's dealing with the perfect sacrifice of Christ. And it's, and it's contrasting His sacrifice, contrasting the blood of bulls and goats with the superior blood that Christ shed. Now, notice what is said here in regards to the blood of Christ here in verse number 14. If someone would, read this verse for us. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit, offer himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from the dead works and serve the living God? Thank you, Sister Gail. Now, notice here. How is the Spirit described in this verse? Eternal. And so when we think about the word eternal, what does that word mean? Forever Forever and ever. You know, what is the longest word in the Bible? Here's a thought question to begin our discussion. What is the longest word in the Bible? You got it, Sister Gail. Eternity. You know, it's hard to wrap our minds around the concept of eternity, is it not? Think about this. Before time, before time even began, who was there? God. And then what's going to be after time ends? God. And obviously you and I, because we're going to live in eternity. But think about that. Before time was, before the world even had a beginning, there was God, the ultimate cause of everything. We'll talk more about this Sunday. So, God is eternal. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God. So God was there in the beginning, And that phrase implies that he was there 
before there was even a beginning. So God is eternal. Hence, we come to now back to Hebrews 9, 14. And here the Spirit is described as eternal. Now, when we look at the, the logical argument, we, we, we set it up this way. The major premise of the argument, as we have demonstrated, God is eternal. And we have set forth the scriptures that, that declare God's eternality. Now, the minor premise in all of this is found here in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 14. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And, it, and indeed, it's referring to the Holy Spirit here by way of that descriptor, eternal. Now, having set forth the major, major premise of our argument and having the minor premise affirmed here in Hebrews 9, 14, the logical conclusion is this. Because God is eternal and the Holy Spirit is eternal, therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. Because only God is eternal. That is, only God is self-existent. And if God is self-existent and God is eternal and He is in, in, the, in, the, in the Spirit is eternal, therefore, the Holy Spirit is God. And again, this refutes the views of, of those who would teach that the Holy Spirit is not, not a, does not have a personality, but rather is a force or a thing. When, it, when, when the Holy Spirit clearly is not, He is a He. He has real personality. He is eternal and therefore he is God. But as we've already talked about as well, He is holy. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 28 now. Matthew chapter 28, and we're going to read a few of scriptures tonight. There's so many on here. And I've, got, and I've given you the scriptures as well. The ones that we don't discuss in this lesson, you'll have them on your outline sheet. And you can take them and study them in your own personal time. Matthew chapter 28 in verse 19, Christ in giving the great commission to his apostles here. In verse number 19, notice what Matthew records, how Matthew records the commission. If someone would, read this verse. We see all three members of the Godhead mentioned here. All right, thank you, Sister Carolyn. Again, the Father, the Son... Now notice, the, whole, the Spirit is mentioned here. Now, how is He described, again, in this verse? We notice the description given to Him in Hebrews 9, the eternal Spirit. What's the description characteristic given to Him here? Holy. holy. Now, who is holy? God is holy. Holy is therefore, holiness is an attribute of God. 1 Peter 1, 15. Also Leviticus 11, verse 44. God told Israel to be what? Be holy, for I am holy. And as Christians today, what kind of lives are we to live? Holy lives. Now why are we to live holy lives? Why does God mandate us to live holy lives? To be more like Him because He is holy, is He not? And, and you think about what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 12. In, in verse number, and this isn't on your outline. If you want to add this to your outline, go ahead. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 15, we're told that we have to follow holiness because without holiness, we cannot see whom? We cannot see God. So holiness is an attribute of God, and holiness is demanded on the part of His people, but yet it, holiness, hope, the principle of hope being holy is also ascribed to the Spirit. Again, this tells me, this tells us, logically concluding, that the Holy Spirit is God because God is holy. But the Spirit is holy. Therefore, the Spirit, because He is holy, is God. And again, it, you know, logical reasoning plays a, part, plays a part in this. So that's the great, second great description or attribute we note of the Spirit here. Now, thirdly, it is also told to us of the Spirit that He is omnipotent or all-powerful. Let's turn now to Luke chapter 1. 
And I do want to go through these here on this outline in this section because I think these really help us to see the fact that the Holy Spirit is God because we are dealing with some of the fundamental attributes of God in our study thus far. Luke chapter 1 verse 35. And again in the context we have the angel foretelling the birth of Jesus. And you know... And the angel coming to Mary and telling her, you know, fear not, thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, call his name Jesus. Now, in verse 34, Mary recognized that she was what? What kind of a woman was Mary? What? She was a virgin. She was a virgin. And so what does she ask? So, so imagine her surprise hear, hearing what the angel says and so what is the question that she asks? How can this be? You know, how can, how can this be? How can I be pregnant? I, I, I'm not, I, don't, I haven't known a man. Now, read verse 35. Look at, the, look at what, what the angel affirms. Someone would read that. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you in the power of the highest will be shed of you. Therefore also that holy one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Thank you, Brother Keith. Now, notice this. What, why, what was the cause of this miraculous conception? Holy the Holy Spirit. So this tells us that this was a, of God. God only... Miracles... Again, let's look at this logically. Who has the power to perform... Who has the miraculous power? Who does miraculous power belong to? God. Mary's conception was miraculous, was it not? There's no doubt about that. Anyone who denies the virgin birth is denying a foundational doctrine of the Scriptures. It's denying the power of God and denying the, power, denying the work of the Holy Spirit too. So the power to do, so God alone has mir, the miraculous power because God is all-powerful and miracles are part and parcel of the divine power. Now, Mary conceived of the Holy Spirit. But Mary's conception was miraculous. Because it was miraculous and because it was of the Holy Spirit, therefore, the Holy Spirit is all-powerful. But God is all-powerful. Well, therefore, the Holy Spirit is God because God is all-powerful. And the Holy Spirit is all powerful. And again, that we're using that logical, common sense reasoning here. And, and so, so and, and, and this passage clearly affirms this because the highest is God and the Holy Spirit and power, and power are connected. So the Holy Spirit is God. But then, fourthly, as we look at the attributes of the Holy Spirit, some of the fundamental fundamental characteristics of God. Fourthly, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 10 and 11. God is all-powerful, but God is also all-knowing or omniscient. In this passage... Let's look at what is said here regarding the Spirit. If someone would, read these two verses for us. Thank you, Sister Gail. Notice this. The things of God knoweth no man, the hidden things of God. Now, can we know certain things that come from God? Absolutely, through the written word. We know that. The, hit, the, the things which have been revealed belong unto us forever, but we cannot know those things which are, are hidden. So the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God, according to this passage. So, how does the Spirit know these things? Because He is God. Because he is God. Exactly, Brother Keith. You know, 
And, and, and do we not see that God, you know, how God, God is setting forth these premises Himself through the Word? And again, he, God in His infinite foreknowledge, it's like He is seeing all the... It's, he sees the arguments, the quibbles of man. And He's answering them right here and there in the Scriptures, is He not? Because we're, that's all we're doing. We're turning to the Scriptures and we're finding out who God is. We see all three of the individual personalities that make up God from the very beginning. Yep. Uh, God is fake. The Spirit of God moved upon the face mm-hmm. of the earth. And we're told then in, in the Gospel of John that Jesus was creator. There you go. Spake all things into... We're going to talk more about that next week. We're going to see the Holy Spirit's work in creation. And we're going to look at it from two fronts, Lord willing. The Holy Spirit's work in physical creation, but also in spiritual creation. Remember, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so we're going to look at that from two perspectives. And so we'll start that next week. And you're exactly right, Brother Keith. We see, we see all three of them. At, we see all three members of the Godhead at work in creation. And, you know, and we'll discuss that more next week. So we see that the Holy Spirit is all-powerful, all-knowing. But then there's a third one. God is all seeing. That is, He is everywhere. You know, when we look throughout the New Testament and throughout the Bible, we taught we taught we have the phrase the eyes of the Lord. Especially in Hebrews chapter 13, in verse number 5, where it talk, talks about. Not Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews, Hebrews 4 verse 13. I, I was going to say Hebrews 13 verse 4. I got it backwards. It's actually Hebrews 4 13. Where it talks about, neither be, about there being no creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of, whom, of him with whom we have to do. Now is the Holy Spirit all seen? Well, let's go to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, let's look at verses 7 through 10. Psalm 139, 7 through 10. And I th- Who wants to read these four verses for us? And again, I, I want to read these because I want to place the particular emphasis on the Spirit and how it is and in, in the characteristics that are ascribed to Him. So if someone would, let's read these four verses here in Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I send into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. And your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall follow me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me. All right, that's good, Brother Keith. But notice this. Thank you for reading that. Look at verse 7. Can we, where shall I go from your spirit? Can we, can we escape God? You know, think about this. When God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, what did Jonah do? He tried to flee from God. How well did that work out for Jonah? Exactly. Adam and Eve tried to hide from God. It doesn't work out very well, does it? And here the psalmist attests, I can't even flee from the spirit from God, the Spirit of God. So that just tells me again that the Holy Spirit possesses all attributes of deity. Just as God is all powerful and all knowing and, and is everywhere, so too is the Spirit. And again, this, this builds our faith in, that, in God and that He is who He has revealed Himself to be. Now, having said all of that, understanding these attributes, let's look at now for the remainder of our class, let's look at some of the designations of the Holy Spirit. This could be an entire lesson in and of itself. When I studied this and I read through some of my books, There are over 52 different appellations for the Spirit. 
throughout the scriptures, over 52. And each are indicative of his various relations, not just but to God, to, to the Son, to his divine nature and character, and even to his relationship with, with you and I. Now, for, the part, for our study, we're only going to mention just a few, which, I, which are sufficient once again to show that the Holy Spirit is God. Now, if you, know, if you note on your outline, I've tried to break these up, break them into various sections. In regards to His nature, you know, the, the term Spirit, what does that indicate? We read this term throughout the Scripture. What does Spirit indicate? Thought question for you. What indicates his divine essence, his divine nature. Remember, God is spirit. John 4, verse 24. That is, he possesses the same essence as God. However, he is not without substance or being, he is not a mere wind, sound, or influence. He is a person. He has personality, as we've already seen, who, in, who inhabits this, the spirit. So he is real. He is not an it or a thing. The spirit is a, is a real personality. But then, understanding that, he is referred to as the spirit of truth in John 14, 17, 15, 26, as well as 16, 13. Now, why is he designated as the spirit of truth. Why is he described as the spirit of truth? What does this tell us about then? Just as God cannot lie, the spirit cannot lie. Well, there you go, Brother Keith. Titus 1, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God hath promised before the world began, cannot lie. And so if God cannot lie, and the Holy Spirit is God, and he is, as we've demonstrated, then necessarily the Holy Spirit cannot lie. And... Uh, and certainly, to, to, to further expand on this, the fact that the, whole, the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of truth speaks to the integrity of His testimony, does it not? And because He did guide the, the apostles into all the truth. In fact, when you look at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, did He not guide the prophets into speaking what God wanted them to speak? So again, He, he guided them into all the truth too in that particular context as well. And, but, and so, as we think about the, the complete Word of God, as we think about the Spirit's prop, part in this, and I think we'll, we'll deal a more, we'll have another lesson which deals further with this. It certainly speaks to us that the Word of God is truthful, does it not? Because the men who spoke these things, the men who wrote these things, were guided by whom? The Holy Spirit. And the Spirit cannot lie because the Spirit is God. And thus the Scriptures cannot lie because they are from God. They're not God, but they are God's revelation to mankind. You would also note in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 2, that the Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of life. That is, again, I love this passage, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And again, it is through the work of Christ and through the work of the Spirit and obviously the Father's forethought and planning and bringing to fruition His scheme to redeem us that we enjoy life in Christ, do we not? Through the Spirit, through, as a result of the Spirit bringing down His inspired Word. He is also referred to as the Spirit of grace in Hebrews 10, 29. Now what, what does... What does this tell us? With the Holy Spirit being called the Spirit of Grace. Not, and, and this is very encouraging too. What does this tell us? Any ideas? The Spirit bestows favor upon us that we have learned mm -hmm. through giving us access to the Word. There you, mm -hmm. 
And she works through the Word. Yep. In, indeed. So we might conclude by saying that everything the Spirit, Spirit does is rooted in the grace of God. Would, would we not say be that? In fact, the Word that the Spirit revealed, according to Paul in Acts 20, 32, is referred to as the Word of God's grace. And if it's the Word of God's grace and the Holy Spirit is God, then we can also refer to it as the word of the Spirit's grace because the Holy Spirit is God and the Spirit gave, brought down the word to us through the means of, of the, guiding these holy men of old and these inspired men, inspiring them to write what was revealed through the Spirit unto them. Again, we talked about him being the eternal Spirit and he is also the Spirit of glory and of God according to 1 Peter 4, verse 14. And so that describes to us the nature of the Spirit, the fact that He is divine. Now, you think about His relationship to the Father. He is referred to as being the Spirit of God. Again, Genesis 1 verse 2, as you mentioned earlier, Brother Keith, and there are several other passages mentioned on the outline. And this expresses His relationship within the Godhead to God, as well as to express His deity. Further, you look in second, the book of 2 Corinthians, you will find that he is referred to as the spirit of the living God. So God isn't dead, is he? God is alive. He is still around. He is, he is still looking down upon his creation. God hasn't gone anywhere. Neither has the spirit. He is the spirit of the Lord in Acts 8.39. In, in Luke 4.18, because he, he shares the sovereignty of God. Christ refers to him in Matthew 10, verse 20, as to, when, in speaking to his disciples and giving them the limited commission as being the spirit of your father. And then Paul refers to him, describes him in 1 Corinthians 6 as being the spirit of our God. So that's his relationship to the father. In regards to the son, he is described as the spirit of Christ in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 9. Uh, the spirit of his son, that is God's son, in Galatians 4, in, in verse number 6. And in Philippians 1, 19, he is described as the spirit of Jesus Christ, all denoting his various relationships. Now, how does it relate to us? Well, let's go to Romans 8, verse 15. And I do want to read this passage. Let's go to Romans 8. In verse number 15, in Romans chapter 8 to me is one of the more difficult passages, one of the more difficult chapters in the Bible. And, and a lot of brethren, I've, you know, whenever I've been, when, when bre fellow preachers and I talk Bible, a lot of brethren believe the book of Romans is the most difficult book to understand in the New Testament, even more so than the Revelation. And Romans chapter 8 is certainly one of those challenging sections of Scripture, and, it, and I find it very challenging myself. And it's a passage that I keep studying over and over again, but it is one of the most beautiful passages in all the New Testament. Look at verse number 15. And uh, if someone would, someone would read verse... Actually, begin in verse number 14 and read verse 15. Read verses 14 and 15. All right, thank you, Sister Carolyn. Now, we'll come back to this later on, especially when you look at verse 16. But look at this. We are the children of God because we've been led by the Spirit of God. How? Through the teaching of the Word today. It's the powerful. The gospel is God's power unto salvation. It's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Spirit's sword is the Word, Ephesians 6, 17. Now, now look at this. Look at this phrase in verse 15. As a result of our heeding the spirit given instructions receive the spirit of adoption this is one of the most beautiful phrases in the entire new testament who brings us into the family of god christ, christ he adds us to his church what makes it possible his blood. his blood and the spirit plays a role here 
through the word. You know, you look at you look at what happened on the day of Pentecost. We talked about this last week. Peter spoke as he was moved by the Holy Spirit. God chose the avenue of words, did he not, to bring men unto him. And he, Peter was obviously guided by the Holy Spirit. And as we pointed out last week, Peter would the Holy Spirit revealed the words of Acts 2.38 to him, did he not? When he spoke that sermon, he spoke as he was moved by the Holy Spirit when, in telling those on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What happened as a result of the preaching? 3,000 souls. 3, souls obeyed the gospel that day. And look what happened day by day after that. What does verse 47 tell us? The Lord added to the church whom? Such as should be saved. Such as should be saved. Exactly. And, and again, the work of the Spirit. And certainly the Spirit of adoption indicates that we are been, we've been brought into the family of God. We've been born of water and of the Spirit. John 3, 3 through, through 6. And of course, Romans 6, 3 and 4 explains the new birth. And, um, you know, I don't want to chase rabbits right now, but, you know, in regards to Romans chapter 6, in regards to John chapter 3 and the discussion of the new birth, I read an article by a young uh, preacher several years younger than I have who tried to make the case in John chapter 3 that the water there is the amniotic fluid of... And, I could just, I just shook my head. How, how can you come to that conclusion? Well, if you've got to be born again, well, what if someone has a C-section? It's born of a C. You know, make salvation impossible. In the physical birth, the, the, uh, you know, it's accompanied by the embryonic fluid. Mm -hmm. What Jesus is doing is comparing the physical birth to With the, the spiritual. spiritual. Exactly, Brother Keith. The water is involved in the spiritual birth yep. as well. Indeed. Form of yep. And again, I've always said Romans 6, 3, and 4 explains, it serves as a perfect commentary as to what Christ was talking about to Nicodemus there in, in John chapter 3. And so, and so we're brought into the family of God as a result of being born of water and of the Spirit. Most people who teach the Bible, or even people in the denominational world, agree that water spoken of in John 3 that, there you go you know even denominationalists won't quibble with that so to try and come up with the, try and argue that it's referring to amniotic fluid is sort of you know unfortunate to say the least but you will also notice that the Holy Spirit is also referred to as the Holy Spirit of promise in Ephesians 1 in verse 13 and so it is we have established the case that the Holy Spirit is deity he is a member of the Godhead, and each member of the Godhead is distinct from the other. The Father is not the Son or the Spirit. The Son is not the Father or the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. And they all have distinctive roles. And so the Holy Spirit we have seen is not simply a force, power thing, or even some spook. He is a being with the same nature of the Father and Son. And thus the foundation of a, of the, of a study of the Holy Spirit must begin with this premise that He is God. And with that in mind, next week we'll begin with a study of the Holy Spirit's work in creation.